Thank you, Caleb. I, I appreciate it. Good to see all of y'all today. Y'all doing well? Good to be back with you in Leesville, Louisiana, Christian Living Fellowship. Got an opportunity yesterday evening to walk through your new facilities down the road. That's exciting. Are you excited? Amen. I mean, it, it is. Just to, just to see and uh, almost feel a little bit, because I've come so many times over the years. I quit counting. You know, I don't know how many times. Bobby and I have been friends for years. Of course, for those of you who don't know, he, he originally... Uh, came out of our church, Household of Faith, in Gonzales, Louisiana. And I do bring you greetings from the swamps of Gonzales. <laughs> it's as hot there as it is here. Oh, Lord, help us. And, uh, but I always enjoy coming to be in Port Y'all. So loving, so gracious, so hospitable. And uh, my wife and I, man, give me a hand for my wife. My wife Stephanie's here with me this time. It's been a while since, I, since she's traveled with me to come here to Leesville. Matter of fact, this month, August 25th, we'll celebrate 25 years of marriage. Come on, son, you got to celebrate that, huh? 25 years and five kids later, we're still... <laughs> That's probably true. She probably knows me well to do that. Oh, yeah, we got to clap for her. I was like, oh, Jesus, that man. <laughs> But we got a chance to go and walk through the new facility. Well, it's at that exciting stage now. You can walk through and kind of picture and envision what it's going to look like. And we were doing that yesterday. What a stage is going to be here. And I hope to <laughs> preach on that stage one day. Well, that would be exciting, huh? Yeah. Worship team will be here and the auditorium's here and the class. You know, just kind of see, put it together as you walk through it now that it's, it, it's, it's coming up even more. And we are excited for you in that venture, just believing that. And I think I said this last time. You want to know how much I know God loves Leesville when I see things like that going on? God loves this place. He loves the people of this place. God, the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish. He wants them all. He wants them all in Leesville. He loves you. He loves Leesville enough that he's going to raise up people, stir up people with obedience and faith, going to give, going to give more, going to give more, going to see that thing finished and just going to see it filled up with people and young people and, and children and adults coming to Jesus, finding their purpose, living out their, God's dream for their life. And it's exciting, man. I just can't wait to see when y'all move in that place. If you have your Bibles today, you can open up to the book of Genesis chapter 15. I'm going to share a, just a portion of a, of a story there, a few scriptures there. Genesis chapter 15, they may have it up on the screen by, uh, uh, when we read it in just a minute. I, the, the title of this message is, I'm not going to tell you again. The title of the message is, I'm not going to tell you again. The battle cry of parents everywhere, isn't it? I'll, get, I'll tell you, boy, I'm not going to tell you again. You get in there, you clean that room, man, I'm not going to tell you again. Girl, you get in there and you do that homework, and I'm not going to tell you again. You get off that phone, stop face chatting, snap texting, Instagramming, whatever it is you're doing, you put that phone down, and I'm not going to tell you again. Right before we tell him again. I know. I know. And again, and again, and again. I'm not going to tell you again. We're going to look at a story here uh, where God is, is actually, he's dealing with Abraham. He's still, as a matter of fact, his name, he still calls him Abram at, at this portion of scripture that we're going to read. And uh, I think that that's, as, you, as we, this story begins to unfold and we read it, I think he'll capture... You kind of get the essence of God's heart as a father as he's talking to his child, his son, Abraham here. And you can, you, you'll get that feeling of God saying, that's it, I'm not going to tell you again. And what God does in place of that, because it's not that God is not some screaming meanie parent that throws hissy fits on we his children when God doesn't get his way or when we don't measure up or meet up or match up to what he's got for us. You'll see in this, in this story where God will tell us, but then if, if, if we as Abraham don't quite get it, God will change strategy on us. And he says, I said, I'm not going to tell you again. I'm going to do something else. Well, that's what, that's what happens in this story. And we'll, and we'll talk about it as we go. This is Genesis chapter 15. I'll start in verse 1. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I'll protect you and your reward will be great. It's not the first time God had told this to Abram. He is trying to convince him of this and get him to grasp this in his heart so he will do and be and become and walk in all God has planned for him. But here's verse 2. 
Here's Abram. He, Abram's got a whole different mindset here. But Abram replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your, all the, your blessings when I don't even have a son since you've given me no children? God tells them one thing. They're basically at a stalemate here. God says it's going to be like this. Abraham says, I don't see that. God says, we're going this way. Abraham says, Abraham says well, what good is it going this way when I don't, I don't even have an heir? God says, I'm going to take care of it. Abraham basically says, I don't believe it. I don't see it. I don't get it. So they just, they're at a stalemate, man. They're, they're locked down. He says, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant of my own household, he's going to inherit all my wealth. You've given me no decision descendants of my own. You talk about rewards. You talk about blessings. You talk about the plan and the purpose. You talk about you're taking me here to bless me. I don't see any of it, God. One of my servants is going to be my heirs. Then God, they're, they're locked. Look, God replies to him, no. God, you see what God, God's, t- he's like, I'm not going to tell you again. He says, how many times am I going to have to tell you? He says, no, your servant will not be your heir. For you will have a son of your own who will be your... I've told you this before, Abraham. And so they're locked down here. They're just kind of in a stalemate. And neither one of them is budging off of their premise. God's saying one thing. Abram's believing what he believes. Look at verse 5. Something happens in in verse 5 where God decides, okay, we're locked down here, man. We're not moving. We're not budging. I'm going to change my strategy. Look what happens in verse 5. Then the Lord, he stopped telling and look what he did. He took. It says he took Abram outside and he began to show him something. He took him somewhere. He showed him something. And in this new strategy, he says, this is what he says. Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. Something happened here. Because look in verse 6. This is out of the blue. This is almost shocking. It says, and Abram, in that moment, he believed God. Something happened here. I mean, something took place. Something major shifted here because it had been for a long period of time in this process that God is saying, Abram, this is what's going to happen. He says, I don't see it. He says, I'm telling you, this is what's going to take place. I don't believe it. This is where we're going. I don't see it. Abram, I'm going to do this. It's not happening, God. And then suddenly, God took him somewhere, showed him something in the taking, in the showing. Something triggered in Abraham where he said, I get it now. I believe you. I believe you. What happened? God, in his infinite wisdom, began to employ a different strategy here. He stopped telling and he started taking. And in the taking, that faith, that belief, that trust, that yes, God, now I get it, that the Lord was looking for, it came into being. And here's what I found out. God will often employ that same strategy in your life and in my life. Let me explain. It might not look just like this, but let me explain. There'll be times in God, you've heard, you've heard it read in the scripture of this abundant life that we're supposed to live, right? Amen. God says, I've got, I've got an abundant life for you, a life of blessings, a life of peace, a life, a life of plans and purpose, a life that, matter of fact, in, it says in Ephesians, exceedingly, abundantly, above, bigger than anything you could think or imagine. God says, that's what I have planned for you. And God tries to, over a course of time, to convince us, you and me, of this. I'm telling you, I've got more for you than where you're living. I've got more. I've got more plans, more purpose, more joy, more peace, more opportunities, more blessings, more resources, all these things. And, we're, and a lot of times, we're just like, we may not think about it, we're just like Abraham. We're like, God, I don't see it. Now, we may not go around telling people we think that, I, you know, because that'll make us look like, you know, sitting in church and we're doubters. We're, you know, what are we doing? We're worshiping God, I believe you. No, I really don't. But we can get in these places, in these ruts and in these routines in our life where we're sort of going through the motions as a Christian. And God is saying, I'm telling you, just like he told Abraham, I'm telling you, I got more for you. But inside of us, there's this almost this empty cry that's saying, God, I hear you, but I don't see it. God, I hear what, you know, Pastor Bobby says. God, I hear, I see, I know what I read in Scripture. But what I read in Scripture, what I see in my life doesn't match up all the time. God, I'm just not seeing it. And we may never even verbalize that to anybody else. But we can get in these places where God says there's more. But in our hearts we're saying, I'm seeing less. 
I'm feeling less. And God says, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. And then suddenly there'll come a season in our life, a situation in our life, a circumstance in our life where without warning, God will just say, that's it. I'm not going to tell you again. I'm not going to tell you. No more telling. Now I'm taking you. And He will take us into a new season in our life, a new situation, a new circumstance in our life. And in that, and I'm going to go over what happens in that. So, Because there's some steps, just a a couple of three steps and stages that, that, that when God begins that work in our life, things begin then to kick. We can sometimes grow more in the taking than in the telling. And that may be the reason for a new situation that you're walking in now and you can't figure out what happened. Abraham, uh, God took Abraham by the, by the hand. He said, let's go outside this tent. I got something. I'm, we're going to talk about what that means to us. He said, I got something outside this tent. I believe maybe this will convince you. And in that motion, in that journey, in that taking into a new situation and a new season in life, suddenly Abraham, he saw something he could have never seen in the tent. And in that journey and in that new place that God brought him to, Abraham said, I see it now and I trust you. That may be what God is trying to get you and I to do in a new place that he's brought you to in life. Now, you may be in that place right now, and you may be freaking out. What has happened, man? What has happened? This is not familiar ground to me. It wasn't familiar to Abraham either. He knew the tent. He didn't know when he stepped outside in the vastness. God may be taking you to some places that's kind of shaking us up to grow us up and to bring us and prepare us for that place of abundance and blessings. He's got to grow us and prepare us for that. That's the journey that was going on here. I'm telling you, sometimes God, He stops telling and He starts taking. Our kids grew up in the swamplands of Louisiana. Man, it's flat, it's muggy, it's hot this time of year. and And so... All they had ever seen growing up was flatlands and a few beaches. And so we got to telling them as they got a little bit older, because Steph and I had been, you know, we said, man, you would like the mountains. But they didn't get it. Hey, you know what, kids? You would enjoy going to the mountains. We want to go to the beach. That's all they knew. Beach, flat, sand, water. I mean, they knew that. They knew swamps. They knew some beaches. And we would tell them. You would enjoy the mountains. Yeah, can we go to the beach? It's like, okay. You tell them. And we, they got to a point in our age where we said, you know what? Let's stop telling and let's start taking. Because I don't think they're ever going to really believe us that there even are mountains. There really are mountains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to the beach. I built a hand castle before. That was pretty high. Is that what you're talking about? No, it's much bigger. It's much bigger. You get to realize that they don't even, they've never seen, they can't even imagine what they've never seen. So he said, let's stop telling, let's start taking. And one, you know, November, we loaded it up. And so we were, <laughs> we're heading out, all of us are in there, we're, we're driving, traveling. And you've ever been, you know, that direction? We're going to Tennessee. You know, somewhere around Georgia is where the scenery starts to change. It's an area around Georgia. And suddenly, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this big rock formation, you know. And so I, I knew it was coming. And so they're back there. They're doing their thing, you know, playing and they do whatever it is they were doing at that time. And they're going, and they're not paying attention. And all of a sudden, I said, hey, kids, check that out. Whoa, that's a pretty dang big rock there. That is a mountain. We like mountains, <laughs> you know. And as, as we drove further in, and then it was, it was, of course, winter, so there was a little snow. As a matter of fact, it began to snow on us as we were driving in. It was wonderful, like a postcard, man. It was like a Christmas card. So it was incredible. And so we stopped. We pulled off. We made little, not big ones, made little Louisiana meatball snowballs. And, <laughs> but we thought it was awesome in the mountains, you know, experiencing that. And now they'll tell you, we love the mountains, But it never would have happened if we wouldn't have stopped telling and started taking. There are things in your life that God wants you to experience that right now our minds can't even conceive them. God's tried to tell us about them, but we've kind of just hung out in the tent. And, and, and felt safe in the tent. And God, He's at a place right now in many of your lives where He said, you know what? No more telling. 
I'm going to start taking. I'm going to bring them to a new season. I'm going to bring them to a new place. But in that, now it sounds, as I tell it to you, it sounds wonderful. It can be one of the most, at the beginning, one of the most frightful experiences you've ever been in. And I'm going to tell you why. We're going to, we're going to, what we're going to do, real quickly, we're going to go over three things that happened when God stops telling and starts taking. What's the three things that happened when God stops telling and starts taking us someplace to do something in our life? Here's number one, if you're a note taker. Here's number one. When God takes us somewhere, the first thing that happens is it breaks our confinement. We don't even realize we're confined. We don't. We, we, we look at our lives and we say, man, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I come to church, support the church. I mean, I give, I serve. I mean, don't go to, we're building a new building, man. I mean, what, what confinement? What could be wrong with my life? We don't even realize a lot of times, especially as American Christians, how easy it is for us to get in a rut, in a routine, and, and what, what really is a comfort zone. We don't even realize how... I mean, the, part of the American dream is to build ourselves a comfort zone where nothing can bug us. Where the stress is gone and worries is gone. Nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody's pounding on me and wanting something. And, and where my life can be stress-free and confusion-free and frustration-free, and I just do what? What I want to do. Leave me alone. That's the American dream. We work years to get to that. We work years and years and years and save and get retired and try to do all this stuff so we can build this great comfort zone and just live a life of doing what we want to do. That's what vacations are all about. Man, I just want to get out of this and get to somewhere I can just do what I want to do and be comfortable. At home, we build these little rooms and places of solitude and, you know, our man cave and our whatever women do. I don't even know what women do. Stay away from our man cave, probably. Ain't going in there. It smells in there. I don't know what he does in there. <laughs> we, 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 we angle our lives heading towards these things, and we don't even realize that comfort zones are so outside of what God... What comfort zones are not even kingdom. They're not kingdom of God. We don't know. We're just, we're, we can sometimes be more American than we are Christian. Because we're just doing what everybody, and we're building these comfort zones, and we're looking for the good life, and we're looking for the, the peace, and we're looking for... Now, we want to be believers at the same time, and God says, you know what? Where I want to bring them, what I want to do in their life, it's so much bigger than that. I've got to get them out of what? That comfort zone. They'll never experience the, the, the faith, the life, the joy, the true satisfaction and joy from living life on the edge and doing what I want them to do if all they ever do is stay confined in their comfort zone. That's what Abraham's tent represented here. It represented a comfort zone. Abraham was familiar with his tent. He knew his tent. He had his tent all decorated. We can decorate our lives all up and put everything in place just where we want it. We don't like anybody messing with it, man. It's my life. I'm, this is my... And we've built ourselves. And it really is a confinement. It's a confinement. It limits our growth. It's small and it keeps us small. It's a safe zone. And we think this is awesome. This is all I need. But the truth is God has got stuff bigger for us than the comfort of our tent. That scripture that I quoted you from Ephesians 3, I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. We can't even ask or think big enough because all we see is what is defined and described in this comfort zone we live in. We can't even think and believe there's something bigger that God has for us out there. We don't even know how small our life and plans really are because all we've ever experienced is our safe little tent where we're comfortable and familiar. And God has set His aim on doing something about that. He loves us so much. God is so much more concerned with, get this, building our character than building our comfort. Now, I don't even, I'm going to be honest, I don't even like to say that because I, I don't want to come across where I'm not American just like you. You know, I've got my room and I've got my flat screen and i got, leave me alone, I'm watching. I mean, I'm not, I know it, I feel it. I mean, I was counting that days down to my vacation just like you. <laughs> getting out of here, man. I'm just getting out of here. I know what it's like. I know what it's about. But I understand God enough to know he's not, God has no problem with our vacations and our flights. I'm not saying that. 
But when we, built our, when we build our life and that becomes the goal and the pursuit of our life, as believers, God says, you know what? I got bigger. I got better. I got more exciting. I got more fulfilling. I've got more blessings. And it can't be experienced in the small confines of that tent you're living in. And God says, I'm about to squeeze you out of that tent. Years back, I had a daughter that had a birthday, 14, 15, something like that. And she said, you know what I want to do? I mean, we're in South Louisiana. This is what she wanted to do for her birthday. She said, we had a tent. I want to put that tent up in the backyard. I want to invite like six or eight of my friends over. We want to camp out in that tent and do our music and do our food and do our everything in that tent. I'm like, awesome, man, because tent, that's outside, man. That's further away from my bedroom. (laughs) I think it's an incredible idea. I think you should go for that. I think you should do that and put the, no, don't put the tent here. Put the tent here. Let me help you, you know, put the tent. So she did. She invited, you know, six or eight of them over, and they put the tent up themselves, and we're just having their girl fun and their girl tent, and all this is going on. And I got a friend, a great friend of mine. His name is Joey. And Joey has done a lot. He's a great leader in the church. He's helped with youth. He's helped with junior high. He's a teacher in the school now. He helps coach in our Christian school. And he's a great guy. He called me up, and he said, Hey, P. Greg, he said, I... uh, I hear you. I hear you got you, you, your daughter. She got a little girl party going on out in the tent tonight. I said that's true, Joey. He said, "What would you think if I came over there later on and scared the bejesus out of him?" I said, "I'm for that. I like that idea." <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, Joey. He said, "I don't know." He said, "Good." I said, "I'm gonna do." He said, "I don't know exactly what I'm gonna do." He said, "What you think?" He said, "I'm bring some guys with me." He said, "What you think I'm gonna do?" He said, "I'm thinking chainsaw something." I said, "No chainsaws." <laughs> Probably not ought to go that route. I like the way you think. I like your creativity. But we'll need a chainsaws at home tonight, man. I don't know what could happen. A lot of of liability there, you know. These girls, their parents, I don't know. They had chainsaws at the pastor's house. I don't know. But outside of chainsaws, do your thing. So I I really forgot about it, and I went to sleep. Sometime about 1 in the morning, I begin to hear the high-pitched screams of 14-year-old girls. (laughs) And I was laid there. I didn't even move. I just laid there. I said, Joey's here. (laughs) He's here. He's here. He's here. (laughs) And it went on for a while. (laughs) And what happened? They came and they they created such an uproar and such a stir within that tent. There's like six or eight girls in that tent. They tore their way out of that tent. (laughs) They ripped their way out of that tent. I didn't think it all the way through because they ripped their way out of the tent and came inside where I was. I didn't think it through. I don't know what's wrong with me. And I think about that story and I says, you know what? That's not too much different than what God wants to do with us. He is going to find a way to get us out of the the confines of our (laughs) comfort zones, to get us to a place where we can believe Him again. He said, I'm I'm going to get them to a place where they can believe me again. This word took, I looked that up, because it says, when I tell that story, it's like, yeah, but they were forced out. In this story here, it just says God took him out. It doesn't sound the same, but I looked up that word took in the Hebrew, and it's much more aggressive than our English word took. It's the Greek, it's the Hebrew word yatsaw, and it means to break out, to escape, to get away. And I said, that's exactly what happened that night. They broke out. They escaped. They got away. Does that begin to tell you about some of the circumstances and situations you may be going through right now? That God has literally, almost like a tube of toothpaste, He has propelled you out from a comfort zone. You find yourself, because let me tell you, it's one thing when you're scared in the tent, but then when you get out of the tent and you realize what it was that scared me out of the tent, I'm now outside with. Exactly. That's our thought. God propels us out. He has to force, listen, I know us. We know ourselves. We're not leaving of our own accord sometimes. 
We've tried too hard to get our life safe and known and comfortable and controllable. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And it's us. We're controlling our life. We're believers. God, we love you. We believe you. We trust you. But I got it here, God. Don't worry. I got this thing, man. And God says, I see what you're doing and appreciate it, but you're getting out, man. I've got more, and you'll never see it. You'll never know it. You'll never experience it in here. And we don't realize it. You said we try to get back in. We don't realize it. But God says, you're going out of the tent. And then he steps on it and won't let us back in. And we turn around, and there's no tent there. That's how we get in life sometimes. Have you ever felt like that? Everything I knew, everything that was comfortable to me, everything that I could trust and fall back on, it's not there. And what's the first thing we say? God, why did you do? What, what, is, what did I do wrong? Did I, God said you did nothing wrong. I'm doing everything right. God, why did you let this happen? Because I love you. Too much to leave you like that. Too much to leave you in that small life that you're living. I've got an abundant life for you, but it's not inside that tent. And we find ourselves out there, and that's the first thing he does, is he breaks those confinements and he gets us out. Then once we're out, that's when step two comes. This is what he, here's, what, here's what step two. He took him out, he, he broke him out. From our viewpoint, we've been forced out, but from God's viewpoint, we've been freed out. And here's the second thing. God, it, it breaks our confinements, number one. It brings out our fears, number two. And initially, this seems very bad. It literally brings out our fears. There's so many things that we have still yet to grow through and grow past and overcome in our life. But in these confines of our tents and comfort zones, we literally have hidden our fears in our tents. We've not faced them. Because it's hard to face your fears and overcome some of these things. The faith and the trust. I mean, I can remember growing up and even as a young person, as a young believer, these fears that I had. And, I, and I'm like, I'm trying to grow in faith, but every time I try to tap a, take a step of faith, there's a fear. And it's, I can understand, it's very easy just to collect all these fears and shove them back down and just say, we're just going to stay in a tent and we'll just call this tent my place of worship. <laughs> And, I, and just say, this is where I worship God. But really, it's just a small place that's hiding all of our fears. So, when God forces us out there, some of the first things that we realize, some of the first, this is actually how you can know that God just forced you out and is breaking your confinements. Fears start popping up everywhere. And we wonder, what's wrong with me? I'm supposed to be a believer. I've been a believer a lot of years, long time, God. Long, where did all this come from? It's like God says, it's been there a long time. There just weren't any circumstances in your life to cause you to deal with it. Just keep them here. Keep them here, down, down, down. Bad stuff. If I, you don't want to see that. It's bad stuff. Don't look at that. And so God says, no, if you're going to go forward into life I have, you're going to have to face them one by one. You're going to have to choose to face that fear with a faith. And so that, that's the second part of it. If you're starting to face some of those fears that possibly you didn't even know, there's been things I've faced at times, I, years as a believer, and then suddenly I'm face to face with this thing, and I realize after a period of time, it's been there a long time. There just was no situation that caused me to face it. And deal with it. And God says, oh, we about, we about to go there. Because <laughs> I love you, we about to go there. What do you think about that? I'm like, wow, I don't know what to do here. God says, what, I, what you've been saying, you do for years. Trust me. Yeah, amen. Yeah. You trust me in this area, in this area, in this area. But this one, you just sitting on it, man. Yeah, come on, God. Now, will you trust me in this? That's how you know God is. That's how you know that God has probably stopped telling and he started taking. That's how you know the confinement's broken, you're out there, and you are freaking out. You're uncomfortable. It seems uncontrollable to you. You're looking for a knob or something. To, how can i I got to fix this because I'm used to fixing everything. You can't fix this. 
It's not about fixing it. It's about faith in it. It's about growing. It's about walking into, <laughs> into the dark with a flashlight and letting God's Word guide you through it. And so that's the second part of it. All these fears that have been pushed down for years begin to come to the surface. And here's the reason. Hidden fears make for a hindered life. Holds us back from where God would have us. We never really grow. And He's not into pacifying our fears. He's into growing our faith. All this happened because God decided He would stop telling and start taking. It breaks our confinement. It brings out our fears. Number three, finally, it builds our faith. Breaks our confinement. It brings out our fears. You're face to face now with things you never, never had to face before. And number three, it builds our faith. As we leave our comfort zones and walk through these situations that God has taken us into, an amazing thing happens. We begin to see God as bigger than you ever did before. Why do you need a big God if we're living in a little tent? If we're living in a little tent, if we're living with little dreams and little vision, a lot of our own control, but really need little faith, little trust, because we got this thing walled off and sealed off in ruts and routines and boundaries that we have set up ourselves. Why do we need a big God if we're living a little life? And God says, good question. That's why I'm pushing you out. That's why He took Abraham out into the great unknown. And begin to show him vast amounts of stars and his future. And that's when, that's when it began to click. God told Abraham, don't be afraid in a tent. And it didn't mean anything to him because he wasn't really didn't have anything to be afraid of in a tent. But that promise meant something to him when he got outside the tent. And now you need to understand what it means to have a big God. To say God is faithful is one thing, but to experience and live it because you're right there on the edge. And if the faithfulness of God doesn't come through for you, you're not going to make it. Then when you say, great is His faithfulness, His loving kindness endures to all generations, and your mercies are new every morning. God, I know that because I have to have it because I'm out here, man. That's when you begin to talk about the faithfulness of God. He's my rock man. He's my deliverer. He's my strong tower I can run to because He pushed me out of this tent and I have to run to Him. He's my glory and the lifter of my head when I get discouraged. All those things now have meaning to your life. And you realize, man, I really didn't need a big God living in a little tent, but now I'm out here in this big faith journey Father, I need you to be big in my life. Wow, God, you're big. Your faithfulness is big. Your grace is big. Your provision is big. Your peace is big. Those are words you'll never hear living in a tent. But once you get out, you begin to hear people saying those things and you think, what's wrong with them? They were No, they got pushed out of the tent and they had to find out how big God was. And if you're beginning to have that same sense and that same feeling and you're reaching out, the Bible says, draw close to God. He'll draw close to you and show you how big He is. Amen. Amen. That's why when Abraham stepped outside of the tent and saw the bigness of God, it says immediately he believed. Amen. Where God is taking you may be very challenging. It may be very difficult. It may feel like it's out of control. But let me tell you this. What you're going through will not tear you down. It's going to build you up to the greatest faith journey of your life. It's not out of control. God's very much in control. That's why He said in His Word, everything serves my purposes, even what you're going through right now. Would you bow your heads with me today? Even what you're going through right now. The enemy has whispered in your ear, it is out of control. You're going down. You're not going to survive this one. God says, no, I'm in control and all things serve my purposes. Everything works together for good to those that love God and have been pushed out of the tent to serve His purposes. Let me ask you this right before we close. If this scenario that I've gone through today describes or begins to define what you're experiencing in life now, it may just be that you're at a place in life, a season in life, 
where God has stopped telling and has started taking. That's a good thing. That's because God has something awesome on the other side of this for you. It's great growth. It's going to be great blessings on the other side of this. If that defines you, if that describes you, with nobody looking around, just simply raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. That's where I'm at. Pray for me. Pray for me. I wanted what happened to my tent. Pray for me. I wanted what happened to my comfort zone. Pray for me. You can put your hands down. Thank you. Hands all over the place. I know we're all in this together. I've had many a tent wrecked by God. Many a tent wrecked by God. And I've walked into many, many a blessing on the other side of it. I look back sometimes and say, what would my life look like if I'd have stayed in that tent? Decorated it up as nice as I could, but just stayed in a small <laughs> confine. What would I have missed out on? God didn't want you to miss out. No, not one single blessing, not one single adventure, not one single place and space of growth in your life. Oh, it's going to be good. And you know, inside of you, there's a knowing. I, I, I hear you, God. I believe you, God. I am just frightened. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for every hand that went up across this place. God, you said there's a season and an activity for everything under heaven. And God, sometimes it's a season of growth where you have ordained growth in our life. But growth does not happen in the safe place. And I thank you that you are expelling us from our safe places, God. But you're bringing us to a place that it, it may not be small, but God, it's enlarged with your grace and your mercy and your peace and, the, and, and your ability in their life to, to make it through, to walk through this. God, and they're going to be bigger. They're going to be stronger. They're going to be closer to you. They're going to know you more. Father, I thank you that they will live and not die. And they're going to declare the glory of the Lord on the other side of this because of what you've done in their life. Just go ahead and take that in. If that's you, just go ahead and almost just grab it and receive it and just tell God, God, I, I, I see. I, I, I understand that, that you, your hand is in this, that this is your plan. And I want to encourage you, lean not to your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You don't see, you can't figure it out. You don't even un- know what tomorrow is going to bring. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, everything you got. Don't lean on your own understanding. What you lean on for support, you'll begin to look to as your source. Don't lean on your own understanding. Lean on Him. Let Him be your source. Let Him be your God. Let Him be your provision, your peace, your grace, your strength, your hope, your belief that there's going to be a better day tomorrow. The Bible says that weeping endures for a night. Sometimes we get pushed out of the tent and we cry. (laughs) We kick, we scream, we don't even understand what's going on. But I'm going to tell you this, joy is coming in the morning. Because when you see God come through and bring you to that new place of growth and blessing, there's going to be an unspeakable joy that's going to come with the rising of that new day and new season. Thank you, God. We walk by faith, not by sight. Not by what you can see today or tomorrow. Just keep walking by faith that God is doing something incredible. It'll be the most incredible journey you ever take. Will there be question marks? Will there be blanks to fill in? Fill in? Absolutely. And God will take the pen from you so you can't fill in the blank yourself. God says, I'm writing this journey, and it's going to be awesome. Father, I thank you for the plans you have for these people and this church. Plans for good and not for evil, to give them a future and a hope. And as my pastor always says, the best is yet to come. Hey, thank you for letting us be with you today. Have a good day.